welcome to the session this morning. Um, today's webinar uh, will be about discussing the state of outcomes-based funding for social enterprises. My name is Tietz Wouters, and I'm a program director at UBS Optimus Foundation. UBS Optimus Foundation is a Swiss-based foundation that supports child health, education, uh, youth skilling, and the environment. We support these areas through a combination of grant funding and outcome-based financing. UBS Optimus Foundation is funded by UBS clients, UBS staff, and by UBS itself. In the last five years, we've really built out uh, our focus on, um, on outcome-based funding approaches. I'm joined today by three great panelists. We have Steve Adudans from Hewatele in Nairobi. We have Suma Pati from PSI, Population Services International in India, and Nyantara Wasa from Living Goods, also in Nairobi, Kenya. Our three panelists will take us through their programs, the outcome-based funding programs, um, after which we'll have a discussion. And of course, we'll have uh, the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Um, the audience are kindly asked to provide the questions during the chat box and we'll moderate those questions and uh, discuss them at the end. Firstly, I'd like to set the scene. In 2016, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were launched to address the world's most pressing challenges, including those related to poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, education, and health. Whilst in many areas we've been doing well, making improvements, for example, global poverty rates have more than half since 2000. One in 10 people in developing countries still live on less than $2 a day, the majority of them in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. At the same time, there's still many children in school, but not learning anything. And in health, we haven't seen the improvements we need to see in lowering maternal and newborn mortality. Only 10 days now, 10 years, sorry, remain to achieve the SDGs. And progress is really stalling. Current funding levels are considered inefficient, resulting in a funding gap of around two and a half trillion dollars. Societies globally, and most in developing countries, are facing huge issues in uh, funding these critical areas in health and education. And these issues have really become a lot worse now following the economic and social strains caused by COVID-19. And as the world now is responding to that, there's really an increased uh, focus by government, philanthropic donors and business on achieving results with that funding. This increase in stress is really putting a lot of uh, uh, a lot of stress on budgets uh, in areas of health and governments really need to assess rigorously what works, what doesn't, why, and really make sure that that funding is really being used efficiently, effectively and accountably. And outcome-based funding can really help to meet those needs. Not only can it play a role in ensuring funding is used efficiently and effectively, it can also play a role in social enterprises by attracting private capital. Private capital focuses on performance. It keeps social enterprises focused on their mission. Whilst normally its, it's use is uh, constrained by risk and return, its uh, performance culture and this business acumen of, of the private sector versus the social sector, th these two shouldn't be mutually exclusive. And bringing them together really offers the opportunity to draw in new funders, uh, to draw in private investors, and to, to build a new path to scaling and funding social results. Outcome of funding is really starting to make a difference in generating measurable social impacts, placing final beneficiaries at the center, and taking risks that others are not willing to undertake, fostering new partnerships between funders, private investors, and social enterprises. Well, outcome-based funding can really be a great tool when the conditions are right. It's not the solution for every type of situation. 
there are really quite a few alchemy-based funding structures that are available at the moment and that are being developed and tested. For example, development impact bonds, impact loans, but also direct equity investments, impact investments. And the opportunity now exists to take those, those learnings, all of these different models, and to apply them more widely. And today we'd like to take a look at three programs, one in Kenya, one in India, and one in Uganda, to see how private investors are playing a role, for example, in Kenya and in India, but also how, in certain examples, self-funded programs can play a role, as the example of living goods in Uganda. I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Steve Adudans. Steve is the chief executive of Hewatel Limited, and he's the executive director of the Center for Public Health and Development, CPHD. CPHD is a nonprofit that helps improve access to quality health services. It founded the social enterprise Hewatele with a mission to provide oxygen and essential medicine, and which is really an essential medicine to patients. As part of its growth, Hewatele has taken an outcomes linked impact loan from the UBS Optimus Foundation. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Could you tell us a little bit more about Hewatele, the social enterprise you had? Thank, thank you, Sietze. And um, thank you for this opportunity to be able to uh, present what uh, Hewatele is about. Um, Hewatele is um, a social enterprise for profit, uh, fully owned by Center for Public Health and Development. And this is, comes from a Swahili word, uh, which means uh, plentiful of air. Um, and uh, as we know, oxygen still remains uh, quite uh, inaccessible, uh, unaffordable, and uh, even much more uh, needed these times of COVID. Uh, oxygen is not being given safely. Um, and therefore, we founded this uh, social enterprise, Hewatele, to be able to increase access to um, uh, to places that do not have oxygen uh, because we know like in sub-Saharan Africa up to at least almost 40 percent of facilities um, where many babies present with uh, uh, pneumonia and other respiratory tract infections they do not get oxygen that is needed and we know oxygen uh, when it's given together with antibiotics uh, reduces the chances of a baby dying by at least uh, 30 percent so uh, uh, this uh, social enterprise uh, based in Kenya, we started off uh, with the support from uh, uh, from financiers, from General Electric Foundation to Grand Challenges Canada, and, and now to UBS Optimus Foundation. And um, uh, what we are doing is to make oxygen accessible by ensuring we have a milkman delivery model where we have patient, uh, we have oxygen being delivered at doorstep of facilities. We make oxygen. Um, uh, um, uh, we make oxygen uh, also uh, cheap and affordable by uh, using um, an eco-friendly um, method of uh, oxygen generation, uh, which is <clears throat> which is called PSA. Excuse me, that's pressure sink absorption method um, at facilities. And also, we've done a public-private partnership where we've partnered with the governments, uh, three county governments in Kenya, to ensure that we make oxygen cheap because the government. Uh, is the largest purchaser of oxygen, and uh, and lastly, we make it uh, safe by uh, deploying uh, tr training for healthcare workers on how to prescribe oxygen, and also ensuring that they have what we call pulse oximeters to monitor patient treatment on oxygen. We have grown steadily from uh, 2014, uh, where we started in a rural area in the western part of Kenya, uh, with our first oxygen plant and steadily grown uh, and got even financing from um, uh, from other financiers because of our steady growth. And to date with um, our UBS Optimus Foundation, uh, we've got um, a financing to be able to increase uh, our capacity uh, by having more cylinders to increase our geographical coverage. And even since right now we have COVID um, with the cases rising, we're having a second spike in Kenya then oxygen is going to be much more critical for uh, treatment of patients who need uh, 
um, uh, who need oxygen, especially uh, as a, uh, for those who unfortunately may go into critical stage. So um, uh, one of the key uh, success factors for us is, um, uh, is having a universal access approach and ensuring that oxygen is available at every level of facility. Secondly, is um, uh, having an outcome-based uh, financing model that we have, uh, we have been able to curate with the UBS Optimus that allows us to be able to focus not only on the sustainability component of the, uh, of the business, but also on um, uh, the social impact of, of the business. And lastly, is a public-private partnership model where we're able to partner with the government to be able to, um, uh, to, be able to provide this much needed essential medicine. So um, uh, I think uh, it, this uh, platform, I hope we can be able to interact on, on this and um, as we seek to see how we can save lives uh, one breath at a time. Thank you. Super. Thanks, thanks a lot, Steve. And it's really, really inspiring to see how your, your business has grown of, over the years and uh, Thank you. how you're now really taking it to the next, next level. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Cool. Um, with that, I'll uh, take the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Sumapati. She is the uh, Director of Programs at Population Services International. Uh, Suma is responsible for the implementation of the Utkrish Maternal and Newborn Development Impact Bond in the state of Rajasthan in India. The program aims to improve the provision of healthcare in small health private healthcare organizations by bringing them up to two nationally recognized health accreditation standards. Welcome, Suma. Uh, thanks for joining us. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, the Eucharist Maternal Impact Bond and also about uh, your role in that? Thank you. Uh, PSI, uh, like you said, uh, is part of the Utrish project. Uh, PSI is an organization, um, you know, based in the US. In India, we've been working since 1984. We work with consumers to accelerate the market, shape markets um, in various health areas, uh, sexual reproductive health, maternal health, etc. And as part of shaping, <clears throat> shaping the market, uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, honored uh, to be, you know, part of the Utkrish project, uh, which is being implemented in Rajasthan, the seventh most populous state in India, where even today, for many women, um, you know, uh, a pregnancy is fraught with risk for, uh, to the health of the mother um, and the child, sometimes even resulting in death, uh, you know, granted and you know there have been significant achievements over the last decade especially um, especially in public health facilities but when we talk about the private healthcare facilities uh, which are accessed by at least one fifth of pregnant women in the state uh, for institution deliveries and you know a significantly higher number uh, for antenatal uh, care, for postnatal care. Uh, if we talk about this sector, we really don't see um, any quality protocols. Um, the private sector, um, and you know, here I'm talking about the small scale healthcare organizations, um, the facilities, healthcare facilities that are you know below 100 beds. Typically, a median range would be 10 to um, uh, 30 bedded facilities. Um, and, you know, not the, uh, the you know, the, the corporate hospitals, the, the 200, 300 bedded hospitals, multi-speciality facilities. Uh, now, this, this sector is, is unregulated. Um, it has uh, no system to ensure adherence to quality uh, protocols, to minimum standards of care, uh, you know, provision to patients, uh, to clients, to patients. Um, and um, though, though we have this kind of system in the public sector, uh, interestingly, uh, where there are quality protocols and standards, and even you know for the larger corporate hospitals, uh, we have uh, you know some some basic level standards. And now this is the space where the project is intervening. Uh, we are we are trying to support these small scale um, healthcare organizations across the state of Rajasthan to improve the quality of maternal care services, um, and in that process, reach six hundred thousand women. Um, and avert at least you know, 10,000 deaths over the period of the project by the end of the project. 
Uh, now, in order to do that, uh, the mechanism um, uh, or the financing model that uh, you know the, for this project for the Utrich project is an outcome-based funding model rather than a traditional grant-based funding. As you can see from the slide, um, uh, the the we have the risk investors, which is the UBS Optimus Foundation, uh, which uh, 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 which provides working capital to service providers, which is uh, if you can go to the next, uh, uh, which is PSI, which is PSI and HLF PPT. These are the two service providers. Uh, uh, where uh, which provided uh, working thank you uh, the, the 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 next and and one more yes thanks uh, so so these are um, these are the uh, these are the service providers that um, uh, UBS Optimus Foundation which is a risk investor provides working capital to what what the service providers do with that working capital is to invest it into providing technical assistance to um, you know, uh, facilities across the stage of, uh, state of Rajasthan uh, to provide technical uh, input, to provide uh, quality inter uh, improvement interventions, uh, to, to improve the quality of care at these facilities so that they are in a position uh, to obtain two recognized certifications uh, which is one of which was a quasi-governmental accreditation, which is uh, for hospitals, which is called the NABH certification. The other is a certification exclusively uh, focused on improving adherence to uh, maternal care services, which is called the Manita certification, uh, developed uh, by the Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in India. So these, so 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 the input is to provide uh, facilities with with training, with uh, with support and cross optimizing processes. Uh, with uh, with providing input that will require them in a lot of cases since there are, these are small hospitals to change their infrastructure so that they would be now eligible to obtain apply and obtain and um, uh, get these two certifications um, the performance uh, you know how far we've gone in terms of developing these facilities and improving quality is measured uh, by a uh, uh, Third, but by Mathematica, which, which is a verification agency, uh, which does uh, uh, periodic assessments, verifications of the project of the outcome performances. And the results of these verification determine where we reach in terms of, uh, of the results, of course, but then determine whether the outcome funders, work from others, and you are saying in this case, are then paying UBS Optimus Foundation for the risk capital um, that they've invested in. So once that happens again, the rest, you know, the, the, the cycle continues where the working capital is again invested back into the project, back into improving facilities, um, uh, the, the, the level of quality in these facilities. And that, that's how the cycle continues. The end of which we would like to say that uh, uh, we should be able to you know, have a pool of facilities, um, and we have a number. Uh, uh, you know, in in in, uh, in as part of the targets, which is uh, 440 facilities, which are ready, which have the quality certification that allow any women, woman, pregnant woman, and actually, since you're working with facilities that offer more than maternal services, we're talking about overall improved, uh, uh, you know, uh, care provision to anyone in Rajasthan accessing any of these private. Uh, you know, 440 private healthcare services. We are almost at. Um, actually, this is this is the phase where the one of the verification rounds is going on right now. Um, by the end of which, we hope to have gone. You know, through two thirds of the journey at least, where we um, would have. Uh, you know, we already have over 300 facilities that have either one of or both of the certifications already obtained, Manita or NABH. Um, Mathematica is currently verifying some of um, the, uh, the facilities. And by the end of it, we, we uh, uh, in the, the next six months, is the last leg, where uh, we should be able to have learnings, not just in terms of how one could improve uh, you know the quality of care in these facilities, in these small healthcare organizations, but also in terms of how can outcome-based funding for health be designed so as to achieve uh, you know uh, results uh, in in a, in the most efficient manner and not just duplicate what we do in grant-based funding. 
so um, that is uh, where we are and um, you know we are um, uh, we are quite excited to have been part of this journey where there have been you know significant learnings not for us as service providers but i think for everyone involved from the verification agency to the outcome funders to certainly i think i hope uh, for the investors as well uh, where we've learned to you know uh, accommodate to uh, um, you know and respond very quickly to changes that have happened in in the in the context uh, you know from covid to uh, to lot more now we say lot more minor things like you know uh, the percentages of uh, those who access public sector versus private sector so uh, yes um, that's that's um, that's our story so far thanks a lot for for taking us through that and it's been really exciting to see how your work has been going uh, in the last years and, and also i think the, the challenges of COVID-19 uh, have brought have been significant, and yeah. maybe we can discuss that later a little bit. Also, how how you're adjusting to that, because I think you have some very interesting learnings there. Fantastic. Thank you. Cool. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to um, Nyantara Watsa. Nyantara is the deputy director, of innovative financing of Living Goods, and based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Living Goods aims to build sustainable community health systems at scale. I've had the opportunity to meet Nyantara and visit the network of community health workers in Uganda. And I've been really, really impressed with your team there. Um, you've just launched uh, a mod modification of that uh, program, and build, really building on what you've learned there so far. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the program and, and, and what what you, how you've kind of launched, uh, relaunched the program, uh, the outcomes-based funding program in Uganda? Of course. Um, thanks, Yetse. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to share a little bit more about um, what Living Goods is doing um, in the outcome-based financing space um, here in Uganda. Um, just as a bit of context, um, Living Goods is, uh, you know, primarily a community health focused organization and kind of the niche area that we really um, specialize in is in technology and performance management systems for community health workers. Um, and as CIT was saying, we're really focused kind of on sustainable health systems and on demonstrating to local governments how to effectively manage their cadres of community health workers so that these are all government recruited community health workers that we're working with um, and really trying to, uh, to kind of figure out the best ways uh, to deploy them to deliver high quality um, you know, health services and to do it cost effectively. Um, Living Goods is, is most, uh, has a, the biggest presence we have is in Kenya and Uganda. We're supporting about 10,000 community health workers um, reaching over eight million people in these two countries, but also have a smaller presence in, in Sierra Leone and Burkina Faso um, and in Myanmar um, currently. And, um, and, you know, as I was mentioning in our model, our community health workers all have smartphones. So they all have technology that helps them to both standardize their diagnosis and treatment protocols for reproductive, maternal, newborn and child health uh, support services that they're offering as they go door to door, uh, you know, to households in their communities. Um, uh, but also uh, the technology allows them to, to actively report in on the, on the work that they're doing so that managers can see performance data in real time um, and are then able to provide more targeted and effective supportive supervision, um, as well as incentive based compensation based on performance uh, to increase the motivation and, and retention of these community health workers. Um, so very early on, actually, in our model, we recognized that we this model is really well suited for results based financing because we were already supporting uh, our community health workers based on their performance. Um, and so um, in, in 2018, um, um, we, we launched a pilot and this is the pilot that CSA visited, but the pilot was in two districts in, in Uganda with about 220 community health workers. And the idea was really to design the first of its kind results based financing mechanism for community health. Um, and to really test if the independent verification systems and the outcome fund management systems, um, you know, would, 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 could work smoothly and that we could develop a governance structure and a, and a structure that would be, would allow scale cost effectively. Um, and we did this and we, we really saw some very significant results. Um, we were able to both establish those systems, but also achieve 98% of the expected results at the end of that pilot. Um, 
So what we're doing currently um, is, is with funding now from USAID DIV, we're scaling this results-based financing mechanism from the two districts we were originally in, in Uganda and Masaka and Chotera uh, to six districts now. Um, and, and increasing the kind of uh, scope of, you know, that we're working with, we're going to work with almost 2,000 community health workers reaching, uh, you know, one and a half million beneficiaries across Uganda. Um, and um, we were meant to launch this results-based financing mechanism um, in March, uh, right as the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic set in here and, and the lockdown um, started in Uganda. And so we took a pause and actually it was a great opportunity for us to think about whether this type of results-based financing mechanism, you know, could be well suited for, for environments that were unpredictable um, and situations like COVID and allowed us to, you know, take a bit of time to make some design tweaks and, and ensure that the risk was manageable despite how unpredictable, our, you know, our programs can be, uh, you know, moving into the future uh, with COVID. Um, we were able to launch, uh, you know, on the 1st of October, um, and, and so we're excited about that. And uh, on the slide that you're looking at, you'll see uh, kind of the key uh, stakeholders that are involved. Um, and what's interesting about this results-based financing mechanism or really outcome fund mechanism is that um, it's similar to, to the PSI mechanism that Suma was just talking about, but we don't have an investor. Um, and, and the main reason that we don't have an investor on board is because Living Goods is, is, is very lucky to have, uh, you know, a large amount of unrestricted philanthropic funding um, at our disposal. And what we really wanted to do was to, to demonstrate the, the key kind of design features and, and, and support um, uh, systems required around verification and outcome fund management um, to launch a successful, uh, you know, community health results-based financing mechanism and then think about, you know, uh, crowding in private sector capital when we needed it, you know, when living goods really needed the upfront capital, uh, but also when we needed to offload some of the risk and, and really think more um, uh, in the world of an impact bond um, and what that could look like for us. So it's certainly something we, we would be looking at in the future, uh, but today are still kind of testing the systems um, as we deploy this mechanism at scale. Um, the current outcome payers are USAID DIV, as I was mentioning, and the Deerfield Foundation. Um, and USAID DIV has put $3 million towards this, this project, but um, you know, has some, some quite significant match requirements uh, for us to be able to unlock that $3 million. So we need to bring in at least an additional million dollars to make the project, uh, the total project at $4 million to be able to unlock some portion of the USAID fund aid, sorry, USAID DIV funding. Um, and then we are also required to bring in, uh, you know, quite a large amount of buy and multilateral funding or government direct government contracting funding towards the organization as a whole um, to be able to unlock some of this funding. So they really want to see more kind of investment into this outcome based financing space as an as an as a final deliverable of this project. Um, and um, so we have also in this structure, the Global Development Incubator, who's playing the role of a trustee or an intermediary outcome fund holder. Um, and, and so all of the funding from USAID DIV and Deerfield so far and additional outcome funding that we will raise is going into this outcome fund. Um, and then we have Innovations for Poverty Action or IPA who are our independent verifier. Um, and, and they are primarily verifying, you know, using phone calls and, and household visits uh, to verify this, uh, the, the data reported in by our community health workers. Um, and currently, uh, there's us Living Goods, uh, who are the implementing partner. Um, and we have Instiglio, um, uh, who has, uh, you know, really been great, great for us uh, over the years, both in helping us to design this mechanism and to play a sort of neutral program management function, um, uh, you know, in this structure. Um, and our hope, as I was saying, um, you know, in the future is to, to raise all of the match funding for this for this program uh, that will continue over the next nine quarters, so almost two and a half years starting um, from now, um, but also to be able to scale this mechanism in the future, bringing um, investors on board and transitioning to an outcome fund with, uh, with an investor, uh, potentially many more outcome payers, and at some point, um, maybe even more service providers. Um, so I'll stop at that and see you. Super. Thanks a lot, Natara. It's really great to, to hear how you've gone on that, that, that in developing out the, the outcome-based funding mechanism and really 
amazing to see how you've been able to, despite COVID-19, launch the program now at, at the start of October. And I'm really excited to see how, how this develops and, and how your path to, to further scale goes. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, I'd li now like to uh, do a bit more of an interactive session and ask a few questions to, to our panelists. Um, and then also like uh, the audience, if you have any questions, please do uh, drop them in our chat box and we can cover those uh, a bit later. So please do put in your questions. I see some questions have already started to come up in the chat, chat box. Great. Cool. Um, so maybe on, on, on that, um, maybe just starting with, uh, with Steve. Um, Steve, um, you know, when you, when you set up uh, uh, Tele and, and uh, what are the types of challenges that, that, you, that you see, uh, you know, uh, funding your business, but also kind of moving to, to an outcomes-based funding model? And, and, and how, do you, how do you, let's say, deliver on, on, on the impact that your, your funders are, are trying to, uh, to see in, in, in delivering, uh, like you say, you know, your, your oxygen, your tanks to, to, to sometimes really far-flung uh, clinics in the countryside uh, and to, to new customers there. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, yeah, and, um, and, and definitely I think um, outcome-based uh, financing uh, has its own good side and also sometimes those challenges do exist. Uh, one of the things that uh, we see as a challenge is um, uh, making a balance between equity and profit. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, a, a, a product or, or a medicine like oxygen is needed by uh, all people regardless of their so social status. And therefore, it should not be a privilege um, for those who actually uh, do have the financing to buy oxygen. And therefore, ensuring that oxygen is available at the lower, lower level facilities, one has to look at how to make it equitable uh, and still preserving the business to be profitable. And out outcome-based financing has those elements uh, even though there are challenges of ensuring that one has uh, considerable uh, financing coming through. So, so when you have um, the challenge of equity and, and profit, it, it, be it becomes uh, qu quite a challenge uh, to ensure that at least you're able to charge that reach, uh, you're able to make a business run. Uh, the other thing is uh, if one is going to that extent that sometimes a competition uh, can be able to be a challenge, especially for those that are focused so much so on profit. So the competition can be cutthroat and uh, can be able to make you and uh, not be able to, um, uh, you know, focus so much so on the outcomes, but mainly on ensuring that you get uh, your revenues in. Um, the other thing is um, the other challenge is uh, sometimes also when it comes to out outcome based uh, financing um, uh, quality uh, can be a challenge because mm -hmm. um, uh, you really want to ensure that you deliver uh, your uh, your product um, or, or your service to um, to places that are far flung to places that are not well uh, uh, you know well served and therefore getting the expertise to that level sometimes um, uh, becomes a challenge and it can come at a high cost and sometimes you you try to make do with what you have so things like task shifting and things like that uh, may have to be what you do because you're uh, you're going to a very very um, remote area so so trying to manage what you have uh, with a little you have um, uh, those are some of the challenges so 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 far I think for us we've managed to approach the market by having a dual approach uh, mm -hmm. For those that are able to afford it, we charge them higher. And, and for facilities that are far flung, then we give them a, a subsidized uh, rate. So, so therefore, for profit um, uh, customers, they have a higher rate. And that helps us to be able to subsidize for the far flung facilities. Thank you. Super. Great to understand a little bit how you're developing that, that in, that in the context. Yeah. And, and also you. now with, with, with COVID. Thank you very much. Yes. Great. For my next question, I'd just like to ask a question to uh, Suma. So Suma, um, for um, the Utkrist uh, did, we've mm -hmm. seen, of course, uh, the COVID has had a, a really big influence, but, but how can you explain a little bit to the audience, how, how, how does the measurement 
uh, happened and what are the challenges associated with the measurement and how has that been changing with COVID? Okay. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the challenges with measurement, you know, from an overall perspective and then get down to uh, what we've done, uh, you know, with COVID and the constraints that uh, due to COVID. So, um, uh, one of the biggest challenge in measurement of outcomes associated with quality improvement is that, you know, just the, the phrase itself, that quality improvement is a process and not, you know, and then it's end in itself. So, um, it's, it's continuous. Um, it's a continuous process of evolution, practice, and implementation. And a measure in time may not actually accurately reflect, um, you know, um, the, uh, the the success that uh, that uh, or, or or you know, or the case may be that you know the limitations of uh, achieving a particular quality standard. Yeah. So uh, what we've seen though through the you know um, you know what the certification agencies who've been in this you know uh, uh, system um, in this in this this this, this context for a long uh, time um, you know with NABH decades and 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 Manita you know certainly a number of years what we've seen is that they have recognized these uh, you know limitations in terms of uh, um, how best to measure uh, quality improvement and have accounted for the fact that this is a continuous process. Um, so we've seen that uh, with, with especially NABH and you know, to an extent with Manita as well. The other challenge we've seen with, uh, uh, with measurement in terms of what Krisht is uh, you know, to adequately assess practice, especially clinical mm -hmm. practice. Um, in a context where, you know, uh, uh, about 60% uh, of um, PSI facilities in, in, you know, under the Swiss project um, are, faci <laughs> are facilities that are remote, uh, in remote towns, in smaller towns, almost rural areas. So here the staffing uh, is not the staff, uh, you know, especially the nurses and the paramedics are not people who are more, you know, very uh, comfortable in, in conversing. And so they'd rather show than tell. So in that yeah. context, when demonstration becomes so important, yeah. how best do you, uh, one, assess quality, and two, who does that? Yeah. So for example, um, with Manita, Manita, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> Manita requires that um, this assessment is, uh, is done by a qualified and trained gynecologist. So those are the ways in which these verification agencies have accommodated, um, you know, <coughs> this um, the challenges uh, with uh, with with measuring quality. Now with COVID, with COVID, uh, we've had this challenge of uh, you know um, being uh, constrained to have online engagements with facilities. So a lot of our engagements with facilities, in terms of building capacities, have also in the period in the last few months been done through an online medium which, you know, from a program implementation uh, perspective, for a lot of facilities for us also was quite uh, efficient in the yeah. sense that, um, you know, they reduced a lot of these ongoing costs, especially travel costs, et cetera. Constraints, of course, have been that there are certain facilities where technology, um, you know, uh, barriers mean that one needs to do, or, or you know, there is a facility yeah. that we have which has, um, you know, a hundred deliveries uh, uh, per month. Now that is that's not the kind of facility that will have the time, uh, you know, to log on uh, to an, uh, you know, in, into an online sort of system yeah. every, uh, you know, uh, twice a week or something like that. So, so there have been uh, issues that we've uh, overcome more or less through technology. Similarly, the verification itself has also um, that the that you know the measurement of performance um, this time round due to COVID. Uh, is an online um, verification that actually mirrors what both the certification agencies are doing. Both Amanita and NABH currently now, due to COVID, are verifying and assessing online rather than on-site. However, there's an element where the assessment has been broken down into, you know, a, a documentation segment. So they're looking separately at, you know, about 100, 150 documents. And then they're doing an on-site visit is essentially, you know, actually going and visiting the facility, but virtually. So, you know, from you know, the entrance 
to uh, the exit to the roof where the water tank is uh that's uh, that's the way that nabh and manata conduct their nabh especially conducts its assessments and that's the way um, you know the verification has changed the uh, uh, format and the medium has changed due to covid um so so it's been interesting but uh, um it's been interesting and you know it's not just that we've learned i think facilities and facility staff themselves have yeah. now become more adept at engaging with technology so that's um, Uh, that's that that means that we will we will use uh, we will use this route uh, uh, um, you know in the days to come uh, regardless of um, covid or not yeah super i mean it's been really fascinating to see that that shift to online and um like you say um the the verifications ongoing and we'll be really interested to hear about the results in in in, in a month or so or two months thanks a lot for that yeah. great thank you Right. I'd like to just uh, ask a question also on the, on this to Tina and Tara. I think um thinking about verification uh how how rigorous is is the verification in in quite a distributed system uh, like yours and, and and what are the challenges you you have? Uh thanks yet say um so our verification process has actually been quite rigorous and um fortunately for us we've managed to keep it relatively uh, cost effective and I think um you know some things that have worked in our favor to help us uh, be able to do this um you know is that as you all know with with health programs um it's really hard to find um you know the right the right spread of metrics um to make sure you're not creating perverse incentives in a results based yeah. financing mechanism um and at living goods um we are super results focused and and in 2014 we did a randomized control trial Uh, which is really the gold standard in in you know impact trials um uh, to and we saw a 27% reduction in under 5 child mortality in the areas that we work um and we're actually in the middle of a second randomized control trial to to assess our continued impact as we scale um and because of this we we've really been able to make that that tie between the causality of some of the output level metrics that are easier cheaper faster to measure and the outcome and impact level metrics that we know were affecting um you know by addressing these output level metrics and so because we were able to pick an array of output level metrics across a full program ranging from um, maternal and child health to family planning and immunization um um you know we were then able to 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 not create perverse incentives and design the verification so that it could be done quickly and effectively um the way the verification works is is that the CHWs or the community health workers are inputting data into their phones that's coming up into dashboards and so it's self reported um and then a sample of this self reported data of of their performance is is verified by IPA um by phone calls and then by household visits for people that cannot be reached by a phone call so we try to minimize costs by reaching as many people as possible uh via phone um i think some of the challenges have really been um you know as we think about how to verify things like quality um yeah. we have included in this in this um Uh, results based financing mechanism some quality quantity metrics around quality as well as some safeguards and minimum thresholds uh, that yep. have really helped us to push forward on that um i think the other challenge is i think the same that everyone is facing which is uh, you know around covid um how do you do household verifications with with contact you know and so we've had yep. to take that out and really focus on just phone phone visits and are really seeing uh, where we land with virtual and remote verification Thanks a lot for that, Nanta. Um maybe just jumping back to 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 Suma, uh some of some of in some terms of um improving the the delivery services, uh do you, see, you how do you feel the kind of pay for success results based uh funding model has has played a role in that in in, in focusing your work? Um so I think um one very clear um um change um, that the pay uh, for success model has led to from you know which is a departure from the traditional grant based funding um is the fact that uh, it appears you know in 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 this this kind of a system uh the you know each participant is doing what they do best um yeah. so the service provider is doing the implementation 
Um, the service provider in this case for the Utkrish project uh, is, you know, working towards uh, improving the quality of care in uh, small healthcare facilities and is doing so, you know, uh, without being constrained, uh, uh, you know, as a traditional grant-based model would constrain us, uh, you know. So, so you will only, for example, um, you are only supposed to spend X percentage of your uh, budget on training and yeah. any shift from X to, uh, you know, X plus 10 percent or X plus 11 percent uh, requires a justification. Uh, yeah. What has happened with not just with COVID, but with everything that changes on the ground is that we've had to be innovative yeah. where, uh, you know, right now, for example, um, there's hardly any travel. So where does uh, where where do we invest our resources and and you know why uh, what works does uh, does a continuous Zoom call work uh, do we have uh, you know hub and spoke model where where there are uh, where there are small on site groups that you know do visits to facilities that are uh, very remote so so those are decisions that require uh, quick thinking changes yeah. and implementation on the ground. A delay of a two a, a two month delay or a, or a month once one delay means that you and especially with outcome based funding where the goals and the milestones you know are almost set in stone that uh, that for us uh, to to uh, accommodate any any such delays means that we're losing uh, you know uh, uh, we we getting far from the goal. So so the the an, a pay for success model allows the implementer the service provider on the ground to adopt more innovative techniques think out of the box uh, and and uh, to achieve the same kind of results rather than being focused on you know providing various justifications of why uh, there has been a deviation from the design there will always be a deviation from the design because what you've done you know what you studied three years uh, before starting the project uh, you you will see that there is, uh, for example, we we looked at the fact that there, you know we did a landscaping some time back, but then in the interim, what happened that more people had access to phones, more people had linked their phone accounts to uh, their bank accounts, and because the government had uh, you know provided incentives from institution deliveries, we had more institution deliveries from the uh, you know uh, getting in uh, uh, so so. So those are changes that happen. That is the environment that changes, and design changes are of you know need to reflect or implementation changes need yeah. to reflect those diversions from design. So that's yeah. uh, that is the change. That's that's one thing that we think that the pay for success model has allowed us to do, and you know get to um, you know where we need to go uh, in the most efficient manner, in the most in innovative manner, which then is something that we use in other programs as well. So that's we know a certain way of. Sorry. Sorry, that's super interesting. I think um, what you're um, and it's, it's also I think reflecting some of the questions that we're seeing now in in the chat box. Um, okay. That um, you know, like you say, you know, this flexibility of of, of of spending your funding, and. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, and then maybe that's an answer to, to, to some of the questions in the chat box as well. Um, okay. This this flexibility of using your costs, right? To, yeah. I, I think it's uh, Tupti answered asked the question about you know what is admin costs, uh, and mm -hmm. I think there's there's uh, a lot more when you're looking at outcomes based on there's a lot more fle uh, potential flexibility. Yes. So you did you don't need to fix that. You know, it could be more okay. if it's needed to achieve the result. It could be more. Absolutely. Great. Um, I'm just going to um, skip a question in the interest of time. I see we have uh, eight, uh, roughly eight minutes left, and I'd just like to briefly also give the audience the opportunity to ask, uh, ask a question. But maybe just a last question, perhaps, to, to, to Nyantara. Um, how, how do you, you feel uh, governments and, and, and funders are, are using uh, private capital to, to leverage programs and specifically your program and, and how do you see the role of the government and, and, and funders there in, in developing out your program? 
Thanks, Yeti. That's a you know a really good question, and I think was a, a really big focus of, of of why we wanted to enter this space for for living goods was to figure out how outcome based financing could eventually crowd in more sustainable sources of financing, uh, and and through you know direct government investments and and government contracting, um, you know some of this work. Uh, but to be honest, I think in in Uganda. Um, we, we realized quite quickly that the government were not quite there. Um, you know, that we were very ambitious. We wanted to attract uh, government funding directly into our outcome fund to be paying for some of the community health work that they, that they would be contracting out. And, and we realized they weren't quite ready for that. Um, but um, interestingly enough, um, the, the government became very interested in the design of our community health model. Um, you know, they became super interested in understanding how you can pay community health workers based on performance, how you can disperse incentives based on performance at the community health level versus at the health facility level. Um, and so we've actually now um, embarked on a, on a slightly separate project in, in one district in Uganda, in Oyam district, um, where we're working with the government to extend their global financing facility or World Bank, you know, RMNCH investment framework program that is currently paying for results at the facility level. Um, we're working to help them to build their capacity to be able to expand that to the community level and for incentives and compensation for community health workers to be coming from government budgets. Um, and so, so there is a real interest there uh, you know, from governments, but I think they're a little bit uh, a ways away from, from being fully ready to, be, to leverage private sector capital and to be really directly contracting out services the way uh, some of our more traditional outcome payers like USAID and others are currently. Super, thanks, thanks a lot, Nyan Tara. That's, uh, that's really cool, really cool to see how that, 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 uh, that evidence is really showing that path uh, to potential scale. Fantastic, great to see that. Um, and maybe I'd just like to, to look at some of the questions that we've had. We've had a few questions uh, about um, materials on outcome-based funding, and I think there was a good link provided on the, on the chat group there. Um, I think uh, on, we'll also be sharing a white paper on our, uh, our Optimist uh, website in a few weeks. So that's another uh, piece of information to look, to look for. Um, but also just feel free to, to reach out to me uh, after this session with, with more specific questions on, on, on documents, etc. cetera. Um, then just briefly touching on, on um, on budgeting and, and costing uh, questions that have, been, that have been put by various members of our audience. Um, and maybe the question is also, maybe I'd like to give that question a bit of a twist um, to say, on the one hand, you have, of course, costs. Um, on the other hand, uh, with outcomes-based funding, we're really looking at results. So I think maybe changing um, the narrative a little bit there, um, in outcomes-based funding, where we really move our thinking to, to results rather than, than, than inputs and, and not being uh, too stuck on which costs exactly go where. Um, maybe just a question to you, uh, Nyantara, what are your thoughts on that, on, on, on the budgeting aspect as you're developing out your programs? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, so for us, um, you know, I think to answer the question very directly on this $4 million project, um, about $3.6 million is going directly towards uh, programmatic funding and directly towards outcomes. Um, and the rest is, is what it's costing us on, you know, three year, for three years of independent verification, outcome fund management, project management, and design. Um, and we did a lot of detailed financial modeling to understand, you know, what would this cost look like at greater scale in years four, five, and six, et cetera. And the good news is that, you know, the big investment that we made of that $500,000 initially was on design. Um, yeah. And, and we don't think that we will require similar dis investments in design as we move forward because we think the design is quite comprehensive and may require some tweaks, but you know won't be full or fully overhauled. Um, and and similarly, we don't think outcome fund management and independent verification will like increase uh, proportionately to the scale of the project. You know, the sample size for independent verification will pretty much stay the same. Um, and so, a lot of those costs will actually stay the same as we go from a four million dollar project to an you know hopefully eight or ten million dollar project 
um, over time. And so I think there's, um, it's a really good question and it can very quickly become expensive um, and mm. actually time incentive, uh, intensive, as you all know, to design these types of mechanisms. Yeah. Um, and so really important to work with, you know, good and skilled uh, pro project design or RBF design players like Instiglio or social finance, I think, in our experience, yeah. um, uh, get effective and efficient at, at how you how you do some of this. Brilliant. Th th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think we, we need to, to, to wrap up with that. I think we're on the hour and I think uh, we might have people that need to go off other sessions. But I'd really like to thank uh, all of you uh, for joining us in the session today and like to thank the audience as well for, for their great stimulating questions. And I think uh, the examples here today and, and the examples that you've given us, the examples of living goods, of Hewatele and of PSI, I think really show you know what's possible and what, what is the impact that we can achieve with outcomes-based funding. Um, and it's really, I think, the starting point for a lot of uh, uh, potential future programs and developing out these programs in, in, in a much bigger way. So I'd really like to thank you uh, for these examples and the stimulating discussion today on our webinar. So thanks a lot.